Okay, folks, this video is supposed to be a supplement to your reading of Chapter 3. In the text, this is about empowerment and human diversity. One of the things that we need to remember that this is why our social workers are interested in studying this at all. One is because of social policy. Social policies are largely in place to help different groups interact with each other in equitable and fair manners. This also can trickle down to individual development of people that are impacted. Institutional or systemic discrimination. Another thing to keep in mind is the relationship between the groups that we're studying about and the dominant culture. That plays a large role in how groups feel about each other, how groups feel about each other now, many times is impacted by the history that they've shared, whether that has been a kind and gentle history or a violent and discriminatory history. We get some basic terms out of the way to make sure that we're all working from the same place. Discrimination is treating people differently. Without action, there is no discrimination. There can be prejudice or many other things that are negative, of course, but for there to truly be discrimination, there has to be an action. People misuse this word in place of prejudice often. It's important that we're using the right terms in the right places so that we're all understanding the right things at the same time. Oppression is putting con extreme constraints on a person. Really, with oppression, you are not allowing an individual or a group to flourish within society, and most likely because they don't have access to the resources that the society has to offer that other citizens of the society do. Marginalization, just having less power than or being viewed as less important than others because you belong to some particular group. If a group doesn't receive the help that they maybe deserve, that's because largely they're ma marginalized. Um, an example of this could be United States citizens in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is an American territory. They are considered citizens. However, many of them live in absolute squalor and have dealt with lack of electricity due to hurricanes for years. And you don't hear about that in the United States, in the continental U.S., because they're American citizens and the American government will step in to help them. But for some reason, we don't help those other colony citizens the same way, largely because they're a marginalized group. Alienation, feeling as if you don't fit in. Most of us have some experience with this through teenage or adolescent years. But there is a big difference between feeling alienated for a short period of time based on a perceived difference and actually being alienated because you really don't fit in. Being the only or one of the very few African-American citizens in a large classroom of largely Caucasian students, and things like that. Prejudice is a prejudgment, an opinion or prejudgment about an individual that is not based on fact. When prejudice gets exaggerated about every person in the group, that's when prejudice grows into being a stereotype. Diversity, we look at what is similar and different between groups in society. Largely, our differences can be used as a way to help us grow and be more effective. Not just as a marker of difference, but diversity can also be used to find commonality between particular groups. At-risk group is just a group that has a higher chance of discrimination because of they belong to a particular said group. Uh, if someone is a racial minority, they are in an at-risk group. Or if someone is in, in as a student, if you have a learning disability, you're in an at -risk, you are in an at-risk group because you have a higher chance of discrimination based on being treated unfairly or not being given accommodations in order to equalize the treatment. It's important for us as social workers to recognize that these differences can expose people to poverty, different marginalization, lack of power, lack of prestige, things like that. Another important thing to keep in mind that we can tell if someone is in an at-risk group or a dominant group, typically if a person is in an at-risk group and they do something 
that the society perceives as negative, that action spreads out to be representative of supposedly all people in the group. Whereas if a person in the dominant group does a similar negative action, he is viewed as the exception. The dominant group is seen as being all bad simply based on the actions of one or two people. But that is the disadvantage of being in such an at-risk group. Other problems where we see minorities are overrepresented in areas of poverty, specifically children growing up in poverty, lower educational attainment. If you look at Texas Tech enrollment, Texas Tech actually has a larger percentage of Hispanic American students than most other universities of its size. However, you think about the idea that universities are largely placed, specifically state-supported schools, are largely placed to support the geographic students in their geographic area. Um, in Lubbock, we have approximately 45% Hispanic population, while Texas Tech enrollment of Hispanics is largely about 19%. So, while, while Texas Tech has a a large population, it certainly is not representative of the surrounding area. Lower wages, you think we often hear about women making less money than men do. This having lower wages can often be compounded if a person is a racial minority as well as being a woman. These can lead to other problems such as in healthcare, housing, education, many other parts of our lives revolve around this. As social workers, what we try to do is most commonly use a strengths-based perspective. Strengths-based perspective is going to look at the strengths rather than the weakness of a client and use these as a point to build skills. Largely, when you're working with client populations, you don't need to tell them their problems. They understand those very well. What we do need to sometimes do is help them build upon the strengths that they already have. Every individual and group is going to have strengths. You have to be creative sometimes in trying to find them, but they, are, they do exist. Even if someone has endured trauma and abuse and very negative things in their life, simply overcoming that and showing that resiliency is a strength at which we can build upon. I want to make sure we're all working with the same definitions of race and ethnicity. Race and ethnicity are both socially constructed. Okay, they're, they only exist because society pays attention to them. Race is, is a socially constructed category who share biologically transmitted traits and their biological traits that we consider important. Largely in the United States, this boils down to skin color, eye shape, and hair texture. Those three things com combine to think of what we think about in race. Um, we have adapted in those ways simply because of different places on the planet that we've lived for thousands of years. But this is a socially created concept because Society pays attention to these things, whether they're important or not. Ethnic group, or an ethnicity, is a group who identify with each other based on ancestry and cultural heritage. Easiest way to remember this is race is constructed from biological traits, while your ethnicity is constructed from cultural traits. One, now, there are groups that are both. They are a race as well as an ethnic group. But one easy way to remember if a we're talking about a race or an ethnic group, is if you learn the behavior that we're talking about, then it's an ethnic group. If you didn't have to learn it, then it is a racial group. You think about, so if we think about an ethnic group of African Americans, if we think about culturally, there are foods we would associate with being African American, music, dance, family rituals, religious rituals, things like that. All of those things are learned. Small children learn those things, whether you are African American or Hispanic American or Caucasian or whatever, you learn those from your parents and your family. That is an ethnic group. You have to learn those things. African Americans we also would associate with being having a darker skin complexion. You don't have to learn that. That is physical or biological. That is the difference between race and ethnicity. Cultures are all of our patterns that we learn, okay, that's passed down from generation to generation. Like I talked about what just a second ago, language, religion, art, common behavioral patterns, how we interact with each other. 
cultural competence is defined as mastery of a particular set of knowledge, skills, policies, programs used by social workers to address the needs of a client or a particular culture. I'll tell you right now, I don't think you ever will master another culture. I think that this is constantly a learning process because culture changes. Even the culture that you consider yourself a part of will change over time. So this is a lifelong process of learning this. However, if you are going to be working with a particular group of people, it is your responsibility to learn about that particular group of people. How do they want people to interact with them? Do they like folks to shake their hands or look them in the eye when they talk to them? Things like that. Those are great skills that can help you as a social worker. Other types of diversity discussed in the text that are certainly important. Social class. We'll come back and have a whole chapter about that later on. Political ideology. That we're seeing a larger divide in our culture because of this with very little middle ground. Um, but it will probably change and swing back in a, to, to being a more middle-centric spot. Um, gender, sex, and sexual orientation are other types of diversity that we can see as well as religious groups. Um, and all of these present their own set of strengths, but they also present challenges for people to try to get past others' prejudices about them. It's also important to remember that when we're working with people, whatever group we are from historically has a history of interacting with people of the client group, and that can get in the way. As a white male, if I am interacting with a person who is an African-American female that may have been treated very badly or her grandparents and great-grandparents have been treated horribly by white Americans, it is irresponsible for me to think that this does not impact our relationship today. And so that we, in order to try to overcome it and grow in, in honest relationships with our clients, we need to address that and be aware that that is impacting even the decisions we are making today. Hopefully this helps clear up a few of the points in the chapter and let you know what are the biggest points that you need to concentrate on while you're reading the, the textbook.